Family Theater presents Jean and Kathleen Lockhart. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Burden on the Family, starring Jean and Kathleen Lockhart. <laughs> Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we're to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our drama, Burden on the Family, starring Jean Lockhart as Captain Twelve Trees and Kathleen Lockhart as Judy. This is it, Uncle Abel. Yeah, I presumed as much. Why must they always build a poor house or a charity hospital in the slums? Well, maybe this wasn't the slums when they built it. Well, I guess you're right, my dear, but it's almost as old as I am and almost as ready for the records. Oh, please, Uncle Abel. If you'll take the case, I'll carry the radio. All right. You know, if I had my way, you could stay with us forever. No, uh, 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 no. I learned a lot from some of the savages I've seen. When one of the tribe grows too old to be of any further use, he's driven away from the campfire to die alone. Oh. No actual violence is committed, so the tribal conscience is clear. Of course, <laughs> a few aborigines simply knock off the old folks on the head with a club. Oh, please, <laughs> Uncle Abel. <laughs> well, maybe the second way is the more merciful. <laughs> now, what an inspiring building. The architect who designed that arch had more accuracy than imagination. City home for incurables. <laughs> Why didn't he make it? Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. The office is over this way, Uncle. And please, let me do the talking. Okay. Judy! Judy, wait for me! Judy! Uncle Abel, what on the matter with you? Uh, I think I just saw an old friend in that wheelchair. A girl I, I used to know. A girl? Well, she, she was a girl back in 1911. Judy Lamport. The most gorgeous creature I ever knew. I, I'd have married her, too, but that was the year that Teddy Roosevelt oh, well, asked me to... We're late now, Uncle Abel. We're supposed to see a Miss Suggs. She's in charge of admissions. Oh, I'm sorry, dear. What? It, it couldn't have been Judy. Not here. Or she married a millionaire when I was away in outer Mongolia. Desmond. Yeah, Desmond, I think his name was. Oh, here's Miss Suggs' office. And don't say anything unless she asks you a question okay, first. Okay, okay, okay. Well, just don't stand there. Come Mi in. Miss Suggs? Of course. Uh, this is Captain Twelve Trees. How do you do? The board's letter said he was to be here at three. Let me have his papers and sit down. Here they are. Uh, sit here, Uncle Abel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Doctor's certificate seems to be in order. And his pauper's oath is properly notarized. <laughs> and I don't know why they keep sending us ambulatory patients. This home isn't intended for people who can walk around and do for themselves. Oh, I, I suppose not. We're very crowded, too. And I'll see if he can stay. First, I'd like a little personal history. Age? Yes, that was his name, all right. Desmond. Desmond, a, a bounder, a bounder and a cat. I asked your age, yeah. Captain Twelve huh? Trees. Oh, uh, yes, uh, 75. Mm -hmm. Where were you born? Um, San Francisco. How long have you lived in this city? Three years, ever since the lecture bureau canceled my bookings. You know, lecturing's been off recently. I should aim for radio or television instead of traveling all Just around the country. Just answer the questions, please. Excuse me. With whom have you been residing? Well, with Mrs. Lipscomb here. She, she's my niece. Mm -hmm. Can't you take care of him any longer? Well, well, we've only a small house and three children. Ned, uh, he's my husband. Ned doesn't make enough to support Uncle Abel and provide the medical attention he has to have and keep the children properly, too. Mm. Hasn't any other relatives? Well, no, we're, we're the only ones. I see. What's your occupation, Captain Twelve Trees? I'm an explorer. Explorer? 
Well, I didn't know there were any explorers nowadays. Well, there aren't. That's our trouble. The flying machine and the war has put us out of business. Everybody's been everywhere. Explorers. <laughs> Only place left to explore is Mars. <laughs> mm. How long you had this ailment? It was two years ago I first discovered I had cancer. We don't mention specific ailments here. Well, that's what I've got. No disgrace, is it? We still don't mention ailments by name. <laughs> well, Mrs. Lipscomb, I'll show the captain to the ward. Then he'll be examined by our resident physician. Visiting hours are from two to five Saturdays. Isn't there anything more for me to do? Nothing at all. We'll take care of everything from now on. We'll expect to see you Saturdays, Mrs. Lipscomb. This is your bed, Captain Twelve Trees. Thank you. Hope you have your own pajamas or nightshirts. I have. And this is Mr. Keyes. He's been here the longest of anyone in Ward 8, so he has the bed by the window. Why don't you call it what everybody else does, Miss Suggs? The old men's ward. Welcome, Captain Twelve Trees. Thank you, Mr. Keyes. Uh, do you by any chance play chess? I do. I mean, uh, I did. But perhaps I haven't completely forgotten the moves. Good. I've got a board and men with me. Ancient ivory and ebony, given to me by a mandarin I once did a favor for in Peking. Oh, hello, doctor. I didn't see you come in. This is the new patient, Miss Suggs? Yes, his name's Twelve Trees. Well, I'll be getting back to my office. Thank you, Miss Suggs. I'm Dr. Vermillion, Mr. Say, you're not Captain Twelve Trees, the explorer, are you? I am, doctor. Well, I read about you when I was a kid. Oh, aren't you the one who located Genghis Khan's Mountain of Power? I am, sir. It was in 1913. 1913. Oh, I wasn't even born then. <laughs> now, uh, do you mind taking off your clothes and getting into bed, Captain Twelve Trees? No. Nope. The law says I must give you an entrance examination, and then we'll see what we can do about whatever it is that ails you. I'll be back in about five minutes. I'll be here for you. Uh, Mr. Keys. The she-dragon who guards these sacred portals mentioned that you've been here the longest of anyone in the ward. Three years and four months, Captain. For your sake, I hope you won't hang on so long. I won't. I have no fear of that. Mr. Keyes, when I entered this uh, delightful institution a few minutes ago, just before I was interviewed by our Cerberus in the white starched uniform, I thought I... I saw an old friend of mine, a woman. In a wheelchair. Do you have any idea where she might be found? Yeah, was she by herself? Yeah. I mean, uh, there wasn't anyone pushing her wheelchair, was there? No, no, she was uh, chauffeuring it herself. Well, and she's probably in the special women's ward on the third floor. Thank you, Mr. Keyes. Now, when the doctor's finished his probing and punching, I'll break out the chess men and we'll have a go at it. <laughs> If, if I've made a stupid mistake, please forgive an old man's confusion. You, you are Judy Lamport, aren't you? I am. I was. I'm Mrs. Desmond. Who are you? Don't you know me? Remember the summer of 1911, huh? Or was it 12? At Long Branch? Yes. And the old West End Hotel? Yes. And the August night we drove to Trenton, and I told oh, you... Oh, you told me you loved me. <laughs> oh, April 12, trees. And you wanted to marry me. Yes. Oh, my dear. My very dear old friend. Mm -hmm. How did you find me, Abel? How did you know me? Well, I saw you the first day I come in, scuttling along the first floor. I called you, but you didn't hear me. Judy, if you've changed, it's only that you're more beautiful than I remembered you. Oh, now I'm sure it's Abel Twelve Trees. Oh, <laughs> you and your foreign wiles. <laughs> uh, what are you doing here, Abel? I, uh... I... Oh, Abel, it's so good to see you. It's bad to be old and poor, and worse to be old, poor, and sick. But worst of all is to be old, poor, sick, and alone. That's what I've been. But now you're here, Abel, I, I won't be alone anymore. Is, is there a place where we can talk, Judy? A place where, where we can sit down? Oh, I don't dare take you into my ward, uh, or even into the library. I'd scandalize the old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> I know, the x-ray room. 
They only use it twice What's a week. What's going on here? Don't you know that male patients aren't allowed on the female floors? Oh, Miss Suggs, this is an old friend. He was just visiting me. This isn't a resort hotel. This is a hospital, a charity hospital. Those who don't abide by the rules will have to get out. Why, you... I, I, I didn't know. Well, you know now. If you want to stay in this home and keep your ambulatory privileges, don't ever prowl around the women's quarters again. I asked you to come to my office for a very special reason, Captain Twelve Trees. Yes? Last night you didn't eat your supper, you didn't play chess with Mr. Keyes, and this morning you refused your breakfast. I didn't feel like eating. Didn't feel like playing chess. I heard the story from Miss Suggs. Mm. However, I don't think you're either a peeping Tom or a wolf who chases helpless old ladies in wheelchairs. I'm on your side. Is that what that rock-faced old Haradan said? <laughs> that and more. But don't you worry about it. Mrs. Desmond is an old, old friend of mine, Doctor. I, I was in love with her when we were both much younger. Yes, she told me about it this morning. I, I wish I'd been an obstetrician. I wish I'd never heard of geriatrics. Why, Dr. Vermillion? Captain Twelvetrees, you're a courageous man, and I can talk to you frankly. It, it's the futility of the whole thing. I, if I could just send one person, just one person out of this place, whole and well... The job would seem worthwhile. Haven't you ever saved one? Not here. In four years, not one. People aren't admitted here unless they're certified hopeless. Once in a while, I've thought I had a victory, but it's always slipped away from me. Captain, do you know what I'd do if I had one cure, just one? I'd march down to City Hall and demand they change the name of the place. Home for incurables. That's enough in itself to cause death from psychosomatic trauma. It's medieval, that's what it is. Eh, you know what it says in Corinthians, Doctor? The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. You'll win, young fellow, but you'll have to have patience. I have patience, Captain, but I don't have the tools. When the Board of Health makes up its budget, we're considered last. As it should be. Where money's limited, spend it where you have the best chance. They give me morphine and sedatives and tell me to make everyone as comfortable as possible. I'm a doctor, Captain. I want cures. We didn't get adequate X-ray equipment here until two years ago. It'll probably be years, if ever, before we get the new isotopes and stuff like ACTH and cortisone. Why, if I had ACTH and cortisone right now, I might be able to save... Save who, Doctor? Mrs. Desmond. Oh. A year ago, I thought her case was arrested. I still think I could lick it if I had this new stuff. Then get it, young fella. Get it. It's rare, Captain. It's scarce, and every milligram is spoken for. Hasn't come out here yet, and when it does, the private hospitals will get it first. I'd have to go to New York and beg for it. It'd be expensive. Would it cure, Mrs. Desmond? It might. And it might be a complete failure. Still, I'd do it, except... Except you haven't the money because you spend every extra dime you make buying little things for people too sick to enjoy them. Well, we're getting away from the reason I asked you in here, Captain Twelve Trees. Now, this is against regulations, but I don't care. If you and Mrs. Desmond want to meet here in my office occasionally, it's all right with me. Huh? If anybody catches you, and Miss Suggs almost certainly will, just say I ordered you in for an examination. Tonight, Doctor? Huh? After supper? Tonight? Will you ask her? <laughs> I'll ask Oh, her. thank you, Doctor. Oh, don't call me Doctor. Just call me Cupid. <sighs> Judy, 40 years ago I kissed you, and never once since then, till now. Oh, aren't we the old sillies, Abel? But isn't it nice? <laughs> yes, 40 wasted years. <laughs> uh, tell me, what happened to Desmond, your husband? Oh, well, he did what a lot of men did in October 1929, Black Thursday. Jumped. Of course, he didn't leave anything but debts, and he took my inheritance with him. But how, how did you live, Judy? Oh, I managed very well. I worked in a department store until I saved enough to open a little hat shop. I was really very successful until the illness came. And 
Then I had to sell my business. Mm, bills, diagnosticians, specialists, laboratory fees, operations, hospitals. <laughs> it doesn't take long to wipe out everything. Indeed, it doesn't, Abel. I went to live with my sister, but her income couldn't provide for both. And both of us and pay for the medical care. Oh, no, I, I have to have so much. So I'm here. Dr. Vermillion's a very nice young man. He did the best he could. Yes, and he can do more, Judy. But he has to have money. And I'm... Oh, God forgive me for the fortune I've thrown away. I'm, I'm as penniless as you. But I'll get the money he needs. I don't know how, but... So help me. I, I'll get it. Abel... You're out of bed late tonight, Captain. <laughs> Don't tell us the whole keys, but I I had a date. A date with a lady. A beautiful lady. <laughs> <laughs> You're a sly one, Captain. <laughs> Just don't let Suggs ever catch you. I won't. Keys, I've got to send about 30 letters. But my hand's so shaky, I'm afraid I could never write them. Now, they're all the same. Now, if I write one, do you suppose you could make the copies for me? Well, I'd be glad to, Captain. I, I haven't written a letter for a long time. You have to have somebody to write to, and I don't have anyone. Twelve trees, you shouldn't be walking around. You should be in your bed. Please return to your ward at once. Uh, I, I, I just came down to ask for some stationery. All we have is stationery with the Holmes letterhead. You wouldn't want that, would you? Oh, that would be fine. It'll save explanation. I suppose you want to complain to your friends of the newspapers. If you have any complaints, you can make them here. I have no complaints. Hmm. How many sheets you want? Thirty. Thirty will do. Thirty sheets? That paper costs money. And I want to write to 30 friends. Captain Twelve Trees, if you had 30 friends, you wouldn't be here. Miss Suggs, No arguments, I... please. Here's the paper. Don't ask for any more at all soon. Thank you. I have the letter all finished, Keys. Read it to me, Captain. Well, <coughs> it says... Dear old friend, I am soon to depart on my last expedition. Where or what the land will be that I explore, I do not know. For this letterhead will tell you it is that bourne from which no traveler returns. And before I leave, I need a sum of money. Not for myself, you may be sure, but for a dear friend whom I would not have accompany me. She's a patient in this hospital, and her doctor informs me that the proper medicines, now unavailable for lack of funds to purchase them, may save her life. I ask you to send me whatever you can. I cannot promise to return the money, or even to send back word of what I find. All I can promise is that those who make the journey after me will find a friend. Sincerely. Uh, that's a beautiful letter, Captain Twelve Trees. Well, I only hope it gets the job done. Now, here's the list of men I wanted to go to. Well, let's see. Why, these men are all famous. Francis Rogers, Explorers Club, New York. Hey, he was my partner in the Gobi Desert. Digby Sandard, Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C. Yep, Digby was my second in command in Anatolia. You know, this may be a wild goose chase keys, but I've got to try it. Some of these men may be dead. Some of them are probably as poor as I am. But some of them may be rich. Ah, but a rich man gets so many begging letters, most of them never get past his secretary. And I don't think any secretary will block this letter, Captain Twelve Trees. I'll get on him right away and finish him as fast as I can. Here's the first one, Keys. Fifty dollars from Digby Sanford. And he writes he wishes he could make it ten times as much. Three letters today, Keys. Ten dollars from Jimmy Waltham, a hundred from Daryl Jenkins, and two hundred and fifty from Jay Carnahan. Listen to this, Keys, from Francis Rogers. I only wish I'd known sooner. Enclosed is one thousand dollars. God be praised. Oh, that puts us over three thousand dollars, Keys. Now, I think tomorrow we'd better tell Dr. Vermillion what we've been up to. Sleep, Doctor. 
He's had a lot of excitement the last few days. Well, what kind of excitement? Well, I'd rather he told you himself. Maybe the news I have will pep him up. Uh, Captain Twelve Trees, wake up. It's Dr. Vermillion. Uh, wake up. Uh, Your girlfriend uh, wants a date tomorrow night, Captain. Huh? Oh, Dr. Vermillion. What? What did you say? I said, your girlfriend wants a date tomorrow night. <gasps> Isn't that good news? Oh, the very best. <laughs> and, and I have good news for her, Doctor. Look, look at these. Oh, what's this? Uh, pay to the order of Captain Abel Twelve Trees, $1,000, Francis Rogers. The total amount is $3,270. Why, you, you plutocrat. What have you been up to? Blackmail? Oh, worse than that. I'm a beggar. I wrote 30 old friends, men who'd been on expeditions with me, asked them for money, and 28 sent it. The other two are probably dead, so I'm a beggar. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Captain Twelve Trees. Your colleagues undoubtedly feel that they're financing an expedition, a daring adventure. That's what it is, you know. Well, when you put it that way, it sounds better. Now, when are you leaving? Leaving? Of course, for New York. What do you think I raised this money for? Right. Now, you buy this uh, ACTH thing and that uh, cortisone. You buy anything else you need for that $3,000, see? Then bring it back here and use it on Mrs. Desmond or anyone else who needs it. Well, I don't know whether this is ethical or not. I, I don't suppose it is. But I'll catch the New York train in the morning. Now, Abel... What is it you want to say? Dr. Vermillion's gone to New York. Somebody gave him enough money to buy some new medicines he wants to try. On you. Me? Yes. And he hopes that it won't be long before you're... before you're all right again. Oh, Abel, I prayed that something like this might happen. Not only for me, but for everyone here. Oh, if he can get one cure, then he can talk turkey to the powers that be down at the city hall. But who gave him the money, Abel? I don't recall that he mentioned any names, but don't worry about that. Just be thankful he's got it. Got the stuff, Captain Twelve Trees. Everything I wanted. Oh, good, I knew you would. I, I just told them the story and they gave it to me at cost. Even at that, it's expensive enough. But that's not all. If it works on your duty, there's a promise of more whenever I get similar cases. Oh, I, I'm so happy I could turn a cartwheel. <laughs> now, you better take it easy, Captain. If I had to make a guess, I'd say the odds were still against us. And by the way, what are you going to do with the rest of the loot? There's over 2,000 left. It's for her, Doctor. All I've got is a past. Maybe she'll have a future. If she gets well, she'll need it. And if she doesn't? Then somebody else will be coming along. Somebody else with a future. You keep the money. All right, Captain. I'm not sure it's legal, but I'll certainly do it. <laughs> Here's Captain Twelve Trees, Mrs. Desmond. Abel, my dear, my very dear friend. I'm taking Mrs. Desmond through every ward, Captain, and she's telling every patient that she's leaving. It's a new kind of therapy here. Abel, Dr. Vermillion told me who furnished the money for my medicines. I won't try to thank you. How could I say the things that are in my heart? Uh, there's no need to. I'll be back every Saturday. Is there anything you want? Anything at all? No, nothing. Got everything you need. Oh, there must be something. Uh, well, <laughs> Mr. Keyes here and I, we, we've been wanting a cheap pair of field glasses. You see, we like to see what's going on out there in the street. <laughs> We'd make it a hobby, like uh, bird watching, except that it'd be people. Oh, you shall have your field glasses next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, Abel, for the moment. And thank you, thank you, my dear. Goodbye, Judy. Would you, uh, would you like some stationery, Captain Twelve Trees? Huh? You offering me stationery without my asking for it? Oh, uh. Well, yes. You see, they're dropping the name incurable, and we're trying to use up our old letterhead paper. Knowing how many letters you write, though you haven't been writing so many lately, I thought, well, I... Well, will wonders never cease. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I'll be glad to help use up your paper. But do you know, Miss Suggs, someday there won't be any such word as incurable. Captain Twelve Trees, I think I believe you. Here again are our stars, Jean and Kathleen Lockhart. Thank you very much, Tony. It's always a very special pleasure to appear on Family Theatre. It's nice of you to say that. It's very true, Tony. You see, Tony, it's this way. Through this program, we Lockharts have a chance to do a little promoting. Promoting? Exactly. For something we believe in, family prayer. It means a lot to us, to Kathleen and me and to June. You see, we're an acting family, and as you probably know, the theatrical profession is not what you'd call fraught with security. True. Yet we've always enjoyed a fair degree of security. Oh, there have been times when the going was a little rough, but God has always taken care of us. We think daily family prayer is the reason, for through family prayer, you are actually inviting God into the circle of your family. You invite him to become a participating member in your family life, and there can be no more valuable member in any family. Inviting God into your family is inviting peace, security, and a thousand other blessings as well. And there's family unity to be considered. Family prayer accomplishes that too, for the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you Burden on the Family, starring Jean and Kathleen Lockhart. Others in our cast were Jean Bates, May Clark, Ralph Moody, and Howard Culver. Burden on the Family was written by Pat Frank and appeared originally in the Saturday Evening Post. Family Theater's radio adaptation was by Jack Mitchell, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and was directed for Family Theater by Joseph F. Mansfield. This series of family theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week when Family Theater will present The Pitchfork Expedition, starring McDonald Carey, Jeffrey Hunter, and Barbara Rush. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Thank you.